Well, for me, manufacturing, I, I worked in the manufacturing sector for uh, quite a few years as I put myself through university. So I worked at places like GM and Ford and in big mining companies. Uh, and one of the first projects I started was photographing Inco uh, up in Sudbury and looking at the mining industry. And back in 1981, I was photographing that. And to me, what was interesting is that having worked in those industries, I recognized that very few of us actually get to see, you know, what those sources of our um, commodities are, where, where our stuff comes from. So there was, as I was working through trying to become a photographer as, and an artist, I uh, recognized that there was this landscape, uh, you know, where we, where we draw materials from, raw materials from, and then there was also this other industry that uh, we we're largely disconnected from. So that's really what was the inspiration to begin to, you know, bridge that disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and as I began to work through it, then I uh, I began to think, well, how else? Where else can I go with this idea? And when one thinks of the industrial revolution and and that uh, you know it was the beginning of the steam engine and the internal combustion engine and 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 metallurgy and science and and material science that all of a sudden you know ushered in the ability for us to build trains and planes and automobiles and um, and I would think that the automobile almost single-handedly created the middle class in, in, in North America. So uh, with the industry of, of road building, bridge building, uh, car manufacturing, car repair, uh, materials, supply for cars, um, you know, the insurance for cars, you know, and then the mobility and the new consumer and the ability to, uh, to be mobile also uh, enabled uh, a vast population to begin to acquire and to build uh, a pretty comfortable life for themselves with the, with the automobile. So the, I kind of saw the automobile as this kind of core core uh, technology that that uh, that shaped the 20th century and the landscape of the 20th century. But when I began to think of how else do I begin to expand this idea, uh, where when we look at the world now, you know, communism fell 20 years ago, um, and so you know. Uh, some version of um, you know uh, market capitalism is is uh, at work almost in every culture, short of a few places like Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe that's it. But <laughs> everybody else is, or maybe you know, maybe in Papua New Guinea, there's a few <laughs> tribes that don't care. Uh, but everywhere else, it's 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 uh, there. There's a kind of a drive towards you know a market-based supply-demand consumer. You know, capitalist structure, mm -hmm. um, and which you know, at its core, begins by creating uh, the consumer or somebody who wants a product, and then the making of the product, and the and the value add to the product, and the profitability. And to me, uh, I began to think of China as you know, you, if if one wants to um, you know get their head around uh, you know um, the industrial revolution 2.0. Uh -huh you got to go to China because yeah. that's what it is. And it's wrought larger than anything we've ever actually created here, you know, with a 1.3 billion uh, population, uh, probably the largest natural resource on the planet, if we think of humanity as a natural resource, um, and then putting that resource to work at a very low cost. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, you know, the, you have a, a, a lethal combination of highly developed, equipment that's being purchased, you know, B2B kind of purchase, business to business purchasing right. that comes into the factory, gets bolted to the factory floor using low cost uh, labor to come in and to run this you know, same machinery. And then uh, also to then bypass a lot of the environmental laws. So whether the externalization or the bad properties of anything that they're manufacturing, uh, whereas they have to be dealt with here in, in, in North America uh, through environmental laws over there, they're, 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 those aren't established. So they get, they get to externalize the problems of manufacturing into the landscape uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the country like China. Mm -hmm. So you have these, this combination that um, allows um, corporations to to produce at a fraction of the cost of what it would cost to do it here with unions, cost of labor, you know, environmental laws, 
and and you know the cost of land, cost of building, cost of everything is 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 at a multiple of uh, uh, um, of what it costs in China. So you can see how once one textile manufacturer making you know sweaters in Montreal or jeans picks up their sewing machines, puts them on a ship, takes them to China or Bangladesh, and starts having them uh, you know having the materials dyed there and having them you know, put, the, put these clothes together, uh, and then coming back to the same market and saying, I can, I can sell these jeans for, you know, 40% less than what you're selling them for, and I'm still doubling my money, you know, so, so that leaves the only opportunity for all the other manufacturers in, in that region, uh, one choice, shut down or relocate. You know, I mean, there, I don't think there's, you can get as efficient as you want, but you can't get to that efficiency. The, so the, the extra shipping cost does not uh, in any way <clears throat> bridge that gap. So, so that's what we've seen in the last 25, 30 years, is a, va a mass migration of industry to China. I don't necessarily think it's going to die off. I mean, and I think what we're finding now in a fairly... Um, kind of rapid um, curve, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing that, um, you know, labor starting to organize in China, they're not able to find workers and they're having to start pay, to, starting to pay them more mm -hmm. uh, to, to work. So, um, and <clears throat> the cost of na natural resources are going up, mm -hmm. the cost of fuel is going up, so the shipping costs are going up. So, so that what I see happening in the last decade in particular is, is, is the gap is closing up a bit, that, that it's not as broad and wide. And even now, uh, the textile industry, uh, it, it's been slowly exiting China and you know, reestablishing itself in places like Indonesia and Bangladesh. Right. Um, in Vietnam even. So, and even Eastern Europe, you're starting to see a lot going on in Eastern Europe and, you know, former, you know, states of Yugoslavia or even in Turkey or, or, or you know, so it's redistributing itself. Other, other um, countries in some stage of development are beginning to pick up uh, uh, at, at these price points where they can actually, uh, um, you know, turn the product around and, and, and make a margin on it. So, so I do think it's, you know, there's a shifting. And I, I think the early, just like Japan, and the first products that came out, you know, weren't as good. They, you know, they were learning. They were, they were getting, a, you know, they were getting their management structures down. They were getting the right engineering and, and the right kind of um, expertise, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> within these factories to, um, uh, you know, to, to be able to run uh, a tight ship. So, um, so that took a while for them to figure out, but I think, I think that's uh, you know improved a lot in terms of um, how the workers being treated in China. I don't think there's been a qualitative improvement in that in in in, in that you know regard mm -hmm. to any degree. I mean, the, you know, the workers still treated as a, a fairly dispensable and. You know, there's, you know, if you don't like this job, there's another hundred people right out the door that will happily take the job. So, uh, so that workforce can be held out of just sheer competition for those jobs mm -hmm. to, to a fairly, uh, again, uh, marginal, um, you know, salary mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to maintain that, that, that uh, competitive edge to, uh, uh, to product uh, and cost of product. So Walmart, you know, I, you know, go to Walmart and just start turning objects around to see, you know, where they're all made. And I would think that 80% are now China. Well, I think perceptions have changed. I think that if you look at the earlier photographers in that exhibition, um, many, many of them are working on behalf of industry to capture, you know, and it was like literally the glory days. Nobody really, you know, there was so much natural resource around that that uh, no one could see that there's an end to it. No one can see that somehow we could ever deplete this. It's just like it's there for the taking. And, and, and so, um, you know, you, there was a, a kind of a more of a, a, a celebration of, of, of the transformation of nature into useful human products and, and that this was not seen as a, a, a negative 
um, you know, um, human activity. It was seen as, uh, um, you know, prosperity and growth and, you know, building a new country. And so all of these kinds of, um, I think, um, narratives and, uh, uh, were, were being played out. And now, you know, starting in um, the 70s, when you, when you think about, um, you know, what happened in the 60s and 70s, you had the, the, the kind of um, Vietnam War, followed, you know, uh, following the, the Second World War, but then the Vietnam War, the, 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 the youth was discontent with, with uh, conscription in America. Uh, there was a you know, rebellion against corporate greed, mm -hmm. the, the establishment, and there was a push away, and people went back saying, let's go back to a simpler life. They were foreseeing that industry and the consumer, the consumer way, and they were called the hippies or the flower child, but they, they saw that consumerism was, was consuming mm -hmm. the popular mind and, and, and that people were displacing happiness from you know relational types of happiness and familial or, or 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 the woman you love or the man you love or being shifted to the love of material goods yeah. um, and and I think they clearly saw that that was a, a path that didn't have a happy ending mm -hmm. um, and that even a search of, of fulfillment through material acquisition was a, a kind of a, a hollow because in terms of the consumer mentality. I mean, the, 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 I, I always see three phases to 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 the the building consumer mentality, and one is, um, you know, the the pursuit. And so you, you know, you're, you know, you you hear about something or you see something in a, an ad or a TV commercial or something. And so you, now you say, I want something. So you're in the pursuit of wanting something. So the idea of if I acquire this, I, I'm going to be happier. I'm going to like it. Or, or it'll, it'll, and then there's a capture. You know, which is like, okay, the buying of it, because now I own it. So I've saved enough money, I can buy it, I own it. And so now you, you have it. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase is then the, just the possession of it, you know, that you now own it. But, but quite frankly, that third phase doesn't have a long lifespan. Yeah. You know, it, it dies out within a week, usually. You know, for most things, like small purchases like clothes and shoes and things are are pretty much, you know, you're not going to get much of an uptick out of that for very long. Yeah. A car or a house might last longer, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but at the, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, a lot of that's, you know, and so the only way to keep, you know, it becomes that, the Imelda Marco shoe problem, right? You know, so you, it's, it's always about the pursuit and capture. The possession's really insignificant. It's, it's just constantly looking for stage one and two of consumer, consumerism. And I think um, in, a, in a kind of a society where we've built you know, material, material acquisition and growth as a, a key uh, uh, you know, delivery system for happiness, um, I think at the end of the day, it, it, it rings quite hollow. You know, and, it, and, and so people are unhappy, but they don't, they're not sure why. They can, have, you know, they can have all the things they want, but why there's still something missing, you know? And until they fully understand that, it's really about their place within society and the people they're close to that are gonna give them more fulfillment than any object, you know? Um, no matter how beautiful or how good, eventually that object stops giving. But, you know, but in our human relations, I think that, and within the self-development, mm -hmm. there's, there, you know, like, you know, to, to understand oneself better, to learn more, to learn something new as, as a form of, uh, of value in our society uh, that far kind of out, outstrips material value. Yeah, well, George Hunter was interesting because he was working you know, 40 years ago. I was working 30 years ago, so just soon afterwards. But he was working, and he, he even talked about some of those images as being really popular images, and people bought them a lot, and, and, and that he was kind of selling them as stock and things like that to companies and things. But, but once, he said, you know, once the environmental movement came in, it kind of put me out of business. Yeah. Right, and which is, and then soon after that, I kind of entered having studied photography and going to the 70s, and the 70s is now post-Rachel 
Carson and Silent Spring and the, the whole environmental movement, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act had come into play in America. Some of the most you know, far-reaching legislation ever devised within a Western country. Um, and um, and so, so there was this big kind of movement. And also in photography, um, what happened was, you know, it moved away from the Ansel Adams and, 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 and Edward Weston kind of <clears throat> celebration of nature in its pure form and, and to celebrate the sublime beauty of nature um, to looking at the landscape as with, with more of an inquiring mind or with a questioning mind with a, that, that it isn't uh, an acceptance, but it's more of a critique. It's like, it's not saying, you know, yeah, I accept that this is how we do things today, but I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. Or I don't see this as, a, as a, a, the scale of what we're doing here or how we're doing it as something that uh, will have a good outcome uh, as we scale this up. Mm -hmm. And I think the new topographic photographers at the time, uh, with Robert Adams kind of being the intellectual kind of um, guru of the group, um, began to define, um, you know, what the parameters of a new way of looking at the world through photography, but looking at it as a questioning, as a poking at, a, 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 is this the right thing to do, or is this where we really want to go? Is this how we want to use our land? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and um, and I think that's where I mean, a guy like George Hunter, you know, was of the world where. People were still kind of that, the glory days of industry, where it's it's like, yes, you know, uh, this is positive growth. This is going to give us new jobs. This is, and, and you know, and, and we're a resource-based economy, and everybody wants our stuff. You know, it's great, and we're still very much like that, by the way, just on a much bigger scale of it now. But uh, but now I think uh, we're at a point where you know, we have information and we can see that no matter how vast the resource is, we are capable of stripping it out. I don't think it's a question of whether artists can. I think any individual in any um, industry can, can become aware of, of all these things and, and begin to um, be a voice within their own world to, to uh, make positive changes. I think it's not it's the, the, this is a collective problem which is going to take a collective solution which is people from all walks of life entering the debate and entering the uh, you know um, the ideas around the constraints that we have and what we have to do to, to fall back into a sustainable uh, envelope mm -hmm. and so I, but I think artists may have um, uh, well, I would say a kind of an interesting role or, 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 or um, possibly a, a slightly more significant because most artists are storytellers. They, they still at the core of what they're doing is that, is that they're translating a perception of the world through a medium into a way that's understandable. And so whether you're a playwright or whether you're a filmmaker or whether you're a photographer or a painter, you could still, you're translating, you're, you're reinterpreting our world. And artists are given the, you know, part of what they do is they 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 reflect back what society, what society's values are, and what the um, outer edges of human experience could be, or might be, you know. So they're always experimenters. They're always like like science and arts. They're experimenting. They're trying to find new ways to interpret who we are, how we think, and what what we value in society, and and. Uh, um, and what society finds aesthetic and what society finds is the next thing, the next beautiful thing. You know, you know, artists are engaged in all of those processes of trying to, you know, through form and through reworking of form, uh, to find new ways in which we, you know, we can um, create things and interpret things. So I think that, that from that position, artists tend to think about the world that we build and that we make more than somebody who's working in a factory floor doing something, right? And their mind is somewhere else, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think that, you know, artists have that privileged position of, of um, being able to hold a mirror back to the world uh, or to themselves and to be able to speak about uh, what they learn and what they experience through that process.